Um, friends, this is a little uncomfortable, isn't it? It's kind of cold. Can you raise your hand if you're feeling a little cold? OK, that's a couple of you. Um, what about wet? Is anyone feeling wet? Just a little wet? My bangs are really wet. Yeah. Yeah. Here we are in the cold as the sun is setting. <laughs> And I'll, I'll get back here. Maybe this will help. Here we are in the cold, the dark, the rain. You know what that reminds me of? Reminds me a little bit of that first Christmas. And I wasn't there because it was over 2,000 years ago. It was written down for us. So friends, in this cold, drippy weather, let's just embrace the discomfort because you are living into what it might have been like that very first Christmas. And in the discomfort, we can sense a little bit of the beauty and the glory of God around us. I can't quite see everybody in the back, so I'm just gonna kinda kneel down. I hope that's okay for you guys on video. Um, I just wanna invite us to still ourselves for a minute as we have a, just a brief word um, and see what Christ wants to ignite in our hearts tonight. Let's pray. Lord, in this cold, drippy weather, with the sound of the chickens, as well as still the glory the beautiful glorias ringing in the air around us from Catherine singing. We come before you ready to celebrate your birth in the cold, in the dark, in the rain, the place where we least expect amongst the animals. I pray, Lord, that you ignite our hearts tonight, that we can see you for who you are, and that you can light up all good things in our life and in the world around us that needs to know you're a good person and your good ways. We give you our discomfort right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. So good evening, friends. It's wonderful to be worshiping with you tonight. Um, as I was thinking about uh, Christmas, um, I was thinking about different members of my family who are no longer with us. And I spent a lot of time this last week reflecting on my grandma and my grandfather, specifically my grandpa. I have to say, if anyone liked a fire, because here we are, we have candlelight behind us. If anyone liked a fire, because we're gonna light our candles pretty soon, it was my grandfather. I never got to attend a candlelight service like this with him, but I think he would approve. I think he would like, especially in a couple minutes when we put our candles together and sing Silent Night. He and my grandma owned and operated a Christmas tree, a Christmas tree farm in upstate New York. So cold, but not as wet. At least it would be snow right now. And even though we didn't live in the US, every couple years we would be able to come to the States to see them. It'd be really great because my grandpa would always have a special night for us where we would get to stay up all night together um, around this big, beautiful bonfire. And it probably wasn't all night. It was probably to like 10 o'clock at night. But when you're a kid, it seems like it's all night long. And so all during the day, I would help him gather all these dead branches and twigs. We would build this enormous bonfire, and he'd clear it with the fire department so they'd know not to come to the farm. And then we would light it ablaze. And Grandpa wouldn't let me ignite the spark that lit up the bonfire, but he would let me get pretty close. In fact, one time I got so close that actually I singed my bangs and uh, melted part of my polyester jacket. This is the 80s. Of course I'm wearing a polyester jacket. <laughs> So making bonfires with my grandpa, I learned that a spark might be small, but it has big potential. It only takes a spark, something small, for a situation to completely change, and in a short amount of time, too. Whether it be the spark from my grandpa's strike anywhere matches to light our carefully monitored bonfire, or maybe the spark of passion between a couple who one day realizes they mean more to each other than they thought. The creative spark between coworkers or between um, students who work better together than apart. Oh, I get to be cozy. Thank you, Rico. The spark of compassionate tenderness that goes, that comes when you go to the Humane Society and you see that fluffy dog and there's this connection made between you and this fluffy animal. It just takes a spark to change everything. There's a spark of unconditional love that comes when you hear your child or grandchild cry for the first time. Being human teaches us that sometimes it's the smallest things of all, like a spark, that carry within themselves the possibility for so much change and newness. There's a small spark that brought us here. Tonight, we're here because 2,000 years ago, 
a little baby was born. That's why we're here. In the big scheme of things, a baby being born 2,000 years ago seems kind of small, not a big spark. This baby came from a town, Nazareth, that nobody believed anything good could come out of it. It was from the wrong side of the tracks. It wasn't an enviable spark. The baby was part of a minority ethnic group ruled by an empire of outsiders who demanded allegiance from those within and without its borders. It wasn't a privileged spark. He was born to parents whose relationship was disapproved of by their community, or at least their scandalous pregnancy with him was frowned on. It wasn't a conflict-free spark. That first Christmas, Mary and Joseph found themselves in a town full of extended relatives, extended ohana, with no one willing to take them in. And the inn itself was too full to offer them shelter. Houseless, they were outside, perhaps in the rain, in the cold, until they found shelter with some animals. It wasn't a rich spark. Humanly speaking, when you look at the story, it's actually hard to see a divine spark in that story. To me, it looks like just yet another all-too-human story of brokenness and scarcity and loss. Right? We see those kinds of stories every day on the news, driving in our car, talking to our neighbors, scrolling on social media. So what was different about this? story, this baby 2,000 years ago? Why did his birth spark something that 2,000 years ago we're willing to sit here in the rain and the cold and the damp to hear the story again? Tonight, we're soon going to light candles in his honor. Why? Why did this baby spark a fire of love that is still burning? Perhaps we could ask the shepherds. So they're the first witnesses to this spark, right? They're the first non-family witnesses to the spark of the baby Jesus. If we could imagine the scene in modern times, um, the angels, they might have appeared to maybe a, a row of, of line chefs smoking outside during a break after a long night's work, or maybe a group of migrant workers weeding the fields, or maybe the angel's song would have burst onto the scene uh, as a, a group of housekeepers carries out the hotel's laundry. There the shepherds are, they're going about their, their nightly work when suddenly the sky above them splits apart and a reality from another dimension, another realm bursts in upon them where they are, right there. And these, these shepherds, these first witnesses, they had the audacity to believe that what the angel said was true. Something stayed in them after the angels left. Something stirred in their souls, and they actually went to go and see what all the fuss was about. They actually wanted to see whether it was true. And there they went, as we heard Pastor Jan read earlier. They, they went into town, and sure enough, the baby was there in the manger, among the hay and the animals, just as the angels said. The shepherds believed this audacious message and this baby's birth sparked joy and belief in them. If you keep reading through the book of Luke, you'll see that everyone who comes in contact with this baby Jesus, something is sparked in them, something is ignited. The prophetess Anna in the temple and the godly man Simeon, they meet this baby Jesus just a few days later after his birth, and they sing God's praises as their souls are ignited with God's hope and God's love searing through this little baby. And later that year, the Magi arrive, um, the book of Matthew tells us, I can imagine their feet were sore, but their hearts were burning as they were on this quest to see this child. Each one of those witnesses, each one of those witnesses came away, changed, reflecting, ignited with joy, with wonder. Something had changed in the world with the birth of Jesus and with knowing him. And tonight, here we are, 2,000 years later, each of you found your way here tonight, whether online or here in person. And each one of us, friends, are to be confronted with the spark that is the baby Jesus. Each one of us comes into this night and this light bearing the weight of our own life, bearing the weight of what has happened to us over this past year, these past two years. Each one of us comes in bearing the weight of our own stress, the weight of our, the ins and outs of our days. If you were to take a moment and just listen to what's bubbling up in you, what might be surfacing? This Christmas Eve, are your feet sore? 
like the Magi? Are you burdened, tired, perhaps weary, a little bit like the shepherds? Are you frustrated or disappointed? You can imagine Mary felt a little frustrated when she realized she had to give birth in a barn or a cave. I don't think either one of those is very ideal. Are you looking for that divine spark in a difficult month or a difficult year? Sometimes life can feel a little bit more like a burden to be born than a blessing to be received. Sometimes it can feel like there is a huge mountain laying in front of us. Sometimes each one of us can have different guilt or losses or pain weighing on our mind. Sometimes we don't feel seen or heard or the emptiness of loss rings in our souls. To each one of us, you know what we need when faced by life's challenges, complexity, and beauty? We need one thing. We need a person who we can trust fully without reservation, a person who understands everything, hears everything, a person who bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, forgives all things. We need a person to whom we can say in the words of the poet, you are rest, you are gentle peace, you are the longing and the one who stills it. This is what we need, friends. We need someone who sees us, who frees us from our suffering, who calls us to light. Someone who can take our burden from us and free us from our fits of rage and from our fears. We need someone who can deliver us from our mind-numbing and soul-crushing ways we cope and cloak over our own image of God with fear and mistrust, with pride and greed and apathy. If such a person existed, that would be a mighty spark indeed to light the fire of God's love and change the world. And friends, here tonight, we attest that this person exists. And every person on earth can find this person because this person calls us to himself, offers himself to us. He doesn't come as a conquering king, but he came as a tiny baby, offering us the gifts of God, the spark of life, good life with him. This is the baby we celebrate tonight, Jesus, the very spark of God's life. And what the shepherds and the magi and the, the prophetess and the holy man and Mary and Joseph, what they all saw in Jesus that first Christmas is the gradual heart knowledge that I've come to know deep inside and I know many of you had, have as well. This baby isn't just you know, God's special worker meant to show us a better way. This baby isn't just a good soul who grows up to be a great leader and enlightened man. But rather, this baby is the spark of God's literal life and love come to ignite our world. This baby is human, and this baby is God. Perhaps the most shocking thing that we affirm about this night. There's the virgin birth. That's kind of surprising, right? We haven't heard of that before. But even more shocking than that is the idea that this baby can be born who is fully human. You know, not God in a meat suit. This is not God shape-shifting. This is a fully human baby with a human body and a human nature. And this baby is God. That's what the incarnation is, friends. That's the big fancy name to describe the very complicated and beautiful truth we see in Jesus. And in the incarnation, this, this marriage, this coming of one, of humanity and God, in the birth of Jesus, something deep in the nature of God opened up to make room for humanity, opened up to make space so that something in us, something in, of us in humanity could open up and make space for God. We love because we are first loved, scripture tells us. A few years ago, as I was reflecting on the life of my grandfather, I realized that my grandpa could have built bonfires any time he wanted. He had enough stuff around the farm, he could have had a bonfire every month if he wanted to, but he waited until my family came in town so we could spend time with him. There's not a lot of things a small child can do around the farm that is safe. I couldn't help, you know, trim the Christmas trees or, or use the mower to cut the grass, but I could gather sticks. All those years I thought it was about the bonfire with my grandpa. But I realized for him it was probably the spark of connection that grew as we made space for each other and as we spent time together. Friends, in the little baby born tonight, God has made space for you 
in God's own self. As Jesus grew from a baby to a toddler to a, a, a grade schooler to a teen, as he grew up, he took up more and more space, walking, talking, laughing, listening. God is no longer like a nice idea or an abstract thought, but now God is completely embodied, taking up space in our world, making space to meet us, spend time with us. Christ is this little child who comes to ignite all the good things of God and our world so the fire of God's love could spread everywhere. Not a fire that destroys, but rather one that mends, that makes whole. The shepherds, they felt this love in their bones as the angels sang. In their little shelter with the animals, Mary and Joseph were consumed by it, freed to be the best versions of themselves. Those around Jesus felt the fire of God's love as he grew up. His followers were gradually ignited by it as they journeyed from him and learned from him. Friends, if you're here and you don't know the spark of the life of Jesus in you, this is a wonderful evening to make space to be ignited by Christ. Even the cows made space around the manger for Jesus. I think you and I can too. He comes humbly to you like a child, wants to ignite all the good things of God, wants to burn away everything that it is not good, that harms. He comes in solidarity to rescue and uplift. As I close, I want to read these words from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a professor and a theologian. He was a moral leader and a, and a resistor during the time of the Nazis in Germany. And so he was in prison for his, his work with the resistance, and he wrote this letter on Christmas to his fellow professing Christians. And he said this about the birth of Jesus, specifically the body of Jesus. He says, the body of Jesus Christ is our body. He bears our flesh. Therefore, where Jesus Christ is, there we are, whether we know it or not. That is true because of the incarnation. What happens to Jesus Christ happens to us. It is really all our poor flesh and blood which lies there in the crib. It is our flesh which, die, which dies with him on the cross and is buried with him. He took human nature so we could eternally be with him. So where the body of Jesus Christ is, there we are. We are his body. So the Christmas message for all people runs. You are accepted. God has not despised you, but bears in his body your flesh and blood. Look at the cradle in the body of the little child, in the incarnate Son of God, your flesh, all your distress, anxiety, temptation, indeed, all your sin is born, forgiven, and healed. So it is, friends, and so it can be. The spark of God's life was lit in Jesus, comes to ignite you and every good thing in our world. As we continue in worship, and as we hear a song sung called Noel, about that first Christmas, I want to invite you to reflect on the spark that is Jesus. And if you haven't made space yet for him in your life, this is a good night to say, God, I give you consent to come in to my life to speak to me, that I can know you. Burn away everything that is not, not love in me. I know there's a lot that's not love in me. I want to be ignited by your very life. Come into my heart, Christ child. So while, Katie, uh, while we, ha we already had Katie sing, which was beautiful, the song of the angels, now as we hear Stacy sing, uh, let's just take a moment to reflect and see what God wants to ignite in each one of us. Thank mm -hmm. you.